You're listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freeb. Hello, chaps. Sounding a little bit under the weather there, Daniel. Yeah, had a nasty cold, but I'm treating it, fortunately. What What? What with? I'm treating it with, with a product called Flumicil, actually. Yeah, effective. I don't know if you've heard I've of that. Never, I've never heard of it. Well, Rich, <laughs> I'm going to go for a run later, and I'll tell you wow. whether it's effective based on my Strava times. <laughs> Excellent. Where did you where did you get this substance? From a chemist. Simon Cope. Oh, really? <laughs> very, very has Simon Cope just flown into Berlin. Very with simple it? <laughs> it was. We're not supposed to oh. talk about this anymore. We've had a lot of okay. a lot of abuse of, well not abuse. We've had some very constructive <laughs> feedback about not talking anymore. <laughs> We've m- about not talking too much about this, not talking too much about politics. We're not allowed to mention politics anymore. No. And we're never allowed to mention football or golf. No. But uh, this week we're going to do part two of our ethical report, our <laughs> investigation <laughs> into the team's sponsors' ethics. No, we're not really. We, we might we might brush Never against, again. up against that again, Never again briefly in part three. Um, uh, got lots well, to talk about. Before well, if we then. couldn't do it properly in an hour and twenty minutes, I we've got lots. Much, lots much hope we can do it. We're going to do the Pro Conti teams this week. <laughs> we are actually going to feature a Pro Conti team this week. We've got a package about Aqua Blue, the new Irish team. Uh, Our lady in the desert, Hannah Troop, was at the Dubai tour last week and she interviewed the members and people behind Aqua Blue. So we'll hear a bit from from that later on. Uh, And we will talk about some cycle racing as well. There's been quite a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Lionel, on that, in that vein, can you give us the news roundup, please? Yeah, well, under pressure to keep it tight this week after after the abuse slash constructive feedback from Daniel <laughs> about the length of the news roundup <laughs> last week. Um, last week was a round of the world marathon because there was so much racing going on. It's been a bit thin on the ground, but we do have to wrap up who won what last week. Um, Marcel Kittel made it three wins from four stages at the Dubai Tour to wrap up the overall classification for the second year in a row. One stage there was affected by sandstorms, uh, which led to the following day stage being cancelled because of high winds we may touch on that a bit later on when we talk about the extreme weather protocol um, in Australia at the Herald Sun Tour Damien Housen the former under 23 time trial world champion wrapped up overall victory uh, Team Sky had a decent week there with Luke Rowe and Ian Stannard each winning stages so they're obviously in good shape what about, what about, King, Kenny? What about King Kenny King Kenny did quite well, but I, I, I'm figuring he's not going to be prepping for the Tour of Flanders and Paris Roubaix in quite the same way as Rowe and Stannard. So it didn't didn't mention him. Also trying to keep it tight, you know. Um, Lillian Kalmajan, who uh, really came to our attention by winning a stage early on in the Vuelta last year. A very impressive stage win there. Um, uh, he spent a bit of time in Nottingham as a student. Not necessarily relevant still owes his entry fees I think for the 10 mile time trials <laughs> in the did. Nottingham area well he's won the Etoile de Bessage stage race the star of Bessage in the south of France set up the overall victory by winning stage 3 quite a list of stage winners there really Arno Demar won a couple of stages Alexander Christophe is off the mark for the season with a sprint win and Tony Gallopin of Lotto Sudal took the final time trial a little story in Het Newsblad uh, the Belgian newspaper reported that the former Belgian time trial champion Stein de Volder missed the start of his time trial and therefore the time cut because he had to visit the toilet just before and basically the call of nature came and he couldn't uh, put it off so yeah he uh, wasn't listed in the results meanwhile in Spain at the Vuelta Valenciana Naira Quintana won overall after taking the toughest stage of the race again another list of pretty impressive stage winners there Tony Martin won uh, the Danish sprinter Magnus Court Nielsen won a stage Brian Cockar friend of the podcast won um, and uh, Wout Poles and Dan Martin were fourth and fifth overall and they were the other eye-catching results there uh, Diego Ulissi of the UAE team won the GP Etrusci in Italy and there was sad news this week that 1956 Tour de France winner Roger Walkowiak has died aged 89 he had been the oldest surviving Tour de France winner following the death of Ferdi Kubler late last year um, but Walkowiak has passed away, and that means that the oldest surviving tour champion is now Federico Bahamontes, the 1959 champion. Yeah, and we will talk a little bit about Walkowiak, and uh, particularly the circumstances uh, surrounding his, his one tour victory. 
in the final part. It's an interesting story, and uh, you know, one, we wonder if such a, a situation might arise again in a Grand Tour. Um, but as I said, there's been a lot of racing. You covered some of it there, uh, Lionel. What caught your eye, Daniel? I mean, um, Nairo Quintana looked looked very good down in Valencia. I thought. Yeah, um, Quintana is obviously embarking on this very ambitious project to try to win the Giro and Tour. There was a bit of uncertainty for a while about whether he would be overruled in that goal that he has by his team management and his manager, in particular Eusebio Unzue. They didn't seem to want him to do the Giro, but he is now definitely going to do the Giro. Yeah, and um, already looking in good shape. I mean, I think just thinking about that, that double um, as we know it's not been accomplished since Marco Pantani did it in 1998 no rider has even ridden the Giro and gone on to win the tour since Pantani in 98 I'm pretty sure in say I'm pretty sure um, I'm right in saying and um, yeah it, it's you know having said that Unzue has been talking talking about it in the press and he he has pointed out that he's had four riders in the history of that team and we talked a few weeks ago didn't we about the history of that team and how far it stretches back but he's had four riders who have won the tour having ridden the Giro so he knows it's possible um this year there are 33 days between the Giro and the tour um just as a point of comparison last year there were 20 27 days between the tour and the Vuelta Quintana of course rode the tour didn't win it but did go on to win the Vuelta so he's got slightly more recovery time between the Giro and the tour this year but I don't know I I I think it's going to be really hard particularly if there's if the Giro turns into a real sort of trench warfare kind of battle between lots of different riders we taught the other the other week about how many good riders are going to do the Giro and, and it's so exacting so demanding these days and you know even Pantani in 1998 I think one of the key factors with him doing the double was that his first week was completely well it was pretty much stress-free because he'd gone into the tour um, claiming not to be interested in the general classification he just minced around at the back and he only really raced sort of the last 10 days of the tour and of course that was the Tour de France 1998 where the peloton was completely preoccupied by the Festina scandal in the first week so I think it was a fairly gentle first week so I think the circumstances have to be have to be right yeah it's difficult to uh, say that it's going to be easy for Quintana I don't the the most recent uh, attempt at it was of course Alberto Contador quite quite recently and he was certainly not in in vintage form when he got to the tour. Quintana's a bit different. Um, maybe he's encouraged by last year when he might have felt that he was in better form at the Vuelta than he was at the tour. He may also be looking on uh, Froome as as being you know too difficult to beat at the tour and the Giro is a sort of insurance policy against a, a blank season. I don't know. Um, it remains to be seen, but he does seem to be the sort of rider who thrives on a lot of racing, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. And I mean, if I was Roman Bardet in particular, I would be thrilled about Quintana trying to win the Giro because I think um, you know you look at the potential winners of the Tour de France, and I, I think there are only uh, maybe two or three. Um, and if you potentially take Quintana out of the equation or you assume that he's going to come into the tour slightly diminished, then you could potentially have Froome very much on his own and, you know, um, all sorts could happen to Froome between now and the Tour de France or in the first week of the Tour de France. And, and who knows, we might see quite an open Tour de France in the end if that's the case. And, and I think that Bardet could be the next in line, the next most likely and behind Quintana and Froome, particularly with the route the way it is this year at the Tour, not much time trialling. Um, yeah, to give France their first win since the 80s. Um, well, I do think, though, that the it's a very different thing doing the Tour first and then the Vuelta. It seems to be. It's completely different yeah. to doing the Giro first and then the Tour. Because I think the level at the Tour, it's not just about how they race in the mountains. It's just the all-round intensity, stress level. Um, I mean, having witnessed the Giro, I'm not saying it's... It, then they're, they're not riding um you know the, the easy three hours and then the, the last hour of racing at the Giro in the way they perhaps would have done in the 70s 80s and even early part of the 90s um 
But the Giro, you know, is this year, if the field's going to be deeper, it could be, you know, a much harder race this year. There's also the, the factor of, you know, unpredictable weather there. And that, transfers, that transfers in Nepal um, as well. We, you know, mm. I mean, we've been booking our hotels, haven't we? And there are some hefty um, days of driving for the riders as well. Well, they won't be driving, but, you know, you know what I mean. Mm. An image of Quintana <laughs> sitting in the driver's seat. <laughs> of his yeah, we should say Quintana, Quintana doesn't have to drive the bus. I mean, he can just he can nod off if he wants. To listen to his iPod. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway. all this falls into the basket oh. of speculation. speculation. The, the beauty, the beauty of the season is that we just don't know. And it, I think that 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 dynamic of having one of the sort of a-list favourites for the Tour de France trying to win the Giro first, I think, is, is absolutely fascinating, particularly when you think that Vincenzo Nibali, you know, I mean, I know you've said, Daniel, that last year's Giro might have been his last Grand Tour victory, but he's going to be very motivated for the Giro this year, isn't he? So the, the, it's not even as if, you know, when Quintana won the Giro, he, he was... Um, you know, he was really head and shoulders above everybody else that year, wasn't he? Um, and that uh, he'll be taking be shots year. from all angles at the Giro. I mean, um, again, we, we talked about it a few weeks ago with Dumoulin, Kreuzweg, Pino, Aru, Nibali. Um, I, the, yeah, Pino I mean, there are going to be very, very few quiet days, and and of course, the the route affords very few quiet days at the Giro, even the medium mountain stages, the transitional stages, um, they can be very demanding. And I think that's that is ultimately why this double has become almost impossible, the, the mission impossible. Da Daniel, another, sorry, another A-lister who popped up at the, down in Valencia was Tony Martin in New Colours. I think you had a Tony Martin Well, not really. I was just curious to, to see him while well, riding so well on, I think it was his first day um, or his first road stage for Katuja Alperson. He won that in a typical sort of Tony Martin fashion. Um, and yeah, just very curious to see how he gets on this year. I mean, I thought that he was a rider who was probably, probably, I've no idea how much he's, a, well, Failing I've no course. idea how much they've paid for him, but I can imagine him um, having commanded a fairly hefty price tag from Katuja Alperson. And, and, you know, his results the last couple of years have not been great. He's, he his time trialing prowess up until the world championships last year when he which he won um had seemed to be on the wane slightly um but he wanted to go to katuja um, partly because of the bike they're riding on in time trials the canyon bike and i mean it's interesting that that teams i mean i'm i think every time trial bike in the world tour now is 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 a decent piece of kit well, it's a decent... They're pretty it's, good, aren't they? Some no, them, it's, a, de really it's a decent good. piece of kit. But, um, you know, I remember I remember noticing this a few years ago and, and just talking to people in and around the peloton about the Canyon uh, time trial bike in particular, that Katuja and um, Movistar's results in time trials both improved dramatically as soon as they switched to Canyon. And I know Tony Martin was very, very keen to get on a Canyon bike at Katuja. So... Um, and he, you know, he's changed. He's gone back to his old position, um, having changed it a bit last year. He seems to be over his knee problems that he had last year. And Katuja are very excited about his chances in the classics. They're going to make him co-leader in both Flanders and Roubaix. They feel that he's got much more chance in Roubaix. Um, that Alexander Kristoff is their better hope in Flanders. But um, you know, he he rode very well in in those races last year, but had to sacrifice himself for Quick Steps leaders Tom Boone and Nicky Terpstra and so forth. So this year will be a lot more independent, and I think um, I think he could go well. Um, what about um, I, I, the thing that's caught my eye in these early weeks of the season is just how well the two Belgian teams are doing, um, winning with multiple riders. Um, quick step. I keep wanting to call them Etics Quick Step. We we quick step floors to give them their, their quick step name. floors now. I kept wanting to say Ethics Quick Step in last week's Ethics mm. Extravaganza, but um, but but missed that one. Um, so get that one in a week late. But Marcel Kittel's looking um, pretty good in the the sprints again, um, and they they really blessed, aren't they? With with Gaviria also mm. off the mark um, in Argentina. Um, and, and and Lotto's victories have come from, you know, riders of all, you know, of very different types of riders, haven't they? Greipel, Tim Wellens and uh, Tony Gallopin. I was also thinking, Lionel, about Kittel. And um, I think we, we 
I think we were in the both in the same in the room at the time when we found out how much Kittle was allegedly earning last year at um, Etix Quickstep and and how much he's earning this year at Quickstep, and it was not very much money to the point where it, it started to make his signing last year um, look like one of the deals of 2016 and um yeah and I, and I think he will he'll give them plenty of bang for buck again this year I mean I think he's he's earning only just over a, a million euros a year something similar to what for example Nasser Buhani's earning at Coffee Dish. so I think Patrick Lefebvre got a pretty good deal there the cycling podcast is supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science Thank you very much indeed to our sponsor, Science and Sport. Very grateful to them for their support. Uh, a little reminder that they are running a competition to win tickets to the London Bike Show. I mistakenly said last week that the tickets were just for the, the first day, the 16th of February. In fact, you can have the tickets for any of the days that the London Bike Show is on. That's the 16th, the 19th of February. It's in London, obviously. Um, and Science and Sport are offering these two tickets plus £100 worth of Science and Sport product. Uh, to enter the competition, go to scienceandsport.com forward slash the cycling podcast. That's scienceandsport.com forward slash the cycling podcast. Um, we are also offering a 20% discount on all Science and Sport product to our listeners. Go to scienceandsport.com and when you go to check out, uh, enter the code, the discount code TCP20. TCP20. I hope all of you got that. The people that ask on Twitter to be reminded of the code. We're not putting it on Twitter. You have to listen. Just, you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. Just pay attention. Get a notepad out. TCP20. Twenty percent uh, <laughs> off. That's that's a, that's really good. Uh, thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport. While we're on corrections and clarifications, I should say that we had a little package last week uh, from the the new David Miller film, Time Trial, in which David Miller mistakenly said that the film would be showing in American theatres, movie halls, cinemas, in April. Um, there will be some private screenings in, in America in, in April, but they will not be, sadly, open to the public. But they are hoping for a release later on. The big focus for them is the Cannes uh, Film Festival in May. Uh, so, apologies for that, but it was, wasn't me, it was David Miller. That got it wrong. Uh, anyway, um, there, we, we're talking again, something we talked about last year a bit, extreme weather protocol. It was a new thing last year. Uh, it had quite a, an effect on some races last year, uh, notably in Pyrenees, um, Terreno Adriatico. We're not quite there yet, but it's already... It's already having an effect, isn't it, Rich? Yeah. Um, stages at the Tour Down Under and the Tour de San Juan both shortened because of hot weather. A stage at Valenciana this week shortened because of high winds and a stage in Dubai cancelled because of high winds. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so it's already um, feeling, uh, making its effects known. Um, I, it's difficult to say without having a whole load of weather data whether uh, conditions are more hazardous than they have been in the past or whether the extreme weather protocol, too many weathers here, um, whether the extreme weather protocol is... Um, altering the the you know the, the way races are able to be run um certainly in the case of down under and san juan i think i'm right in saying these these were circuit races so quite easy to chop a lap or two off and and shorten the amount of time the riders are in very hot weather but when stages are point to point um the logistics get much more complicated don't they particularly when you get to you know factor in the the host towns and the sponsors and and all of that kind of thing um and uh, you know i suppose at its heart nobody wants to see racing cancelled but on the other side nobody wants the riders working in uh, conditions that are uh, dangerous for their health and safety daniel what's your point of view on this well lionel uh, a couple of interesting things have been said and written about this this week and um our, our colleague jeremy whittle wrote a column on cycling news in which i think he quoted alan piper and and i think alan piper made, made a good point that um once upon a time or not that long ago 20 years ago most riders well they pretty much lived where they had grown up and they took whatever the weather throughout them all in training as well and i think the message that riders get now is that cycling is a a good weather sport in the sense that um, they travel across the world to go to training camps. Um, the you know the races at this time of the year now are are generally they're cherry picked 
um, for the, the climate in those particular countries or regions. So, and I, I think the only real exception to that is the whole Belgian swing um, or the whole sort of North European spring season. Um, but otherwise, it's really a sport which is has kind of tailored itself to finding the best weather. So then when they, they go to Valencia or Dubai and they're confronted with very unusual weather conditions or adverse weather conditions, then I think the instinctive reaction is that A, they're not used to it and B, um, they, they don't really particularly want to have to um, put up with those kind of conditions. I, I don't think they're necessarily being soft, but um, I think it, it's an instinct which is becoming ever more hardwired. Worth pointing out, Daniel, you and I had an email from Michael Carcase, the executive director of the Association of North American Professional Road Cyclists, which has been pretty active the last couple of years in in really acting as a you know a riders group, a, a you know a, a voice for the riders. Um, makes a, a distinction between stage races and one day races in terms of the likelihood of uh, the extreme weather protocol coming in you know in a one day race a rider has perhaps more of a choice about whether he carries on or not in a stage race um, there may be a, a team obligation to, to, to carry on uh, when it might be dangerous to do so one day races are a bit more um, maybe less likely to be they certainly haven't been affected so far i think i think to get back to Ghent wevelgem a couple of years ago obviously before extreme weather protocol came in the one that luca paolini won hugely entertaining race um that would be an interesting test case a race like that in such strong winds when riders were being blown off the road i remember gary thomas was blown off the road i think a rider ended up in the canal at one point and luca paolini won it it was a great race it was a very different type of race to watch you wouldn't want a race like that to be to, to, to fall foul of the extreme weather protocol and that will be an interesting uh, test case when it happens. Well I think just from, from um, reading that email we received it makes the point that initially when the extreme weather protocol came in there was a desire for it to have hard and fast rules so you know perhaps going even as far as specific temperatures uh, you know or, or temperature plus snow or um, in the case of high winds a wind speed or a gusting wind speed um, uh, the difficulty is, if, for example, if you had a similar, uh, similar condition to the Dubai Tour um, last week in one of the Belgian classics, there would be more of an appetite to race there. That's exactly what you're saying, um, Richard. Uh, and I always just think back, not, not many years now, to the Milan San Remo, which was stopped and then the, the riders all got into the buses and cut out perhaps 50 kilometres, I think it was, and then got back on and, and resumed the race. And in, it probably shouldn't devalue the victory. It was um, Chiolek who won that year, wasn't it? Uh, The German rider. It shouldn't devalue that victory, really. But I think on some level it kind of does because the the sort of the USP of Milan San Romo is that it's almost 300 kilometres, the longest one-day race on the calendar and so on. Um, But, you know, the, the sport has got to decide... Um, probably on a case-by-case basis. A a hard and fast rule is not workable. As much as the riders and teams and everybody else involved would want there to be um, certain sets of circumstances that make the decision, uh, you know, by the rule book rather than sort of having sort of an arbitrary decision made, if you have a rule book which which basically has to be followed, you could end up in a situation where, you know, the majority of the riders want to carry on racing and you know, prevented from doing so. And that's not really where the sport wants to go because one of the, the key things about it is that survival of the fittest, you know, the toughest guy wins and so on. Funny that you, you say that about, you know, Chilex win being divided. I think that often has more to do with the identity of the winner. If you look at 1980 Liege, Bastogne Liege, you know, running, true, yeah. running snow, Bernardino, only a very few riders finished. You know, that was probably, in inverted commas, one of Eno's easiest wins in the sense that all he had to do was really finish the race in, in a way. But it's probably one of his most famous victories and, and it's passed into, you know, the legend of the sport because it was Eno uh, that won it. So it, it very much depends, I think, on the identity of the rider. This links to a discussion we'll maybe have in the final part about Wachowiak. Um, but returning to Dubai, where the extreme weather protocol did come into play once again. Um, Hannah Troop was out there for the cycling podcast and she, over the course of the race, spoke to a few of their riders and staff. We'll hear from Stephen Moore, the general manager, uh, and a few of the riders um, from the new Irish team, Aqua Blue, a pro Conte team, and Dubai Tour was one of their first big races. 
So here they are, Aqua Blue. It started a couple of years ago in Ireland as an amateur team. I'm Stephen Moore, I'm general manager of Aqua Blue Sport, Ireland's first pro continental cycling team. Rick, the team principal or owner, um, has been a hugely passionate cycling fan for a number of years um, and he wanted to get more involved in the sport so he, I suppose he dipped his toe in um, with this amateur team at the beginning and um, started off very small and built and built and has has now grown to I suppose be the, the strongest amateur team in Ireland um, and then this was the natural progression to get more involved in the professional scene. So when was the idea of Aqua Blue to take it to a professional team? How long was that in the pipeline for? Um, I suppose about two years. Yeah. Yeah. Our goal from the start is, is to make not the first but a, a truly sustainable cycling team um, and that's what we're going to aim to do through aquabluesport.com. Um, so success is, it, is not just on the road, it's, it's across the company as a whole um, and it, it's, it's building towards um, being as best we can on the road. Um, and promoting Irish cycling as, as best as possible. Hey guys, I'm Adam Blyde and I ride for Aqua Blue Sport. Okay, so Adam, how was yesterday? You came 10th, so what was the feeling like after the race? Um, yeah, it was good. I was happy but a bit disappointed, you know. Um, I was up there in a good position and it's just like 800 to go. My legs started to give way a little bit, but it's first race, first sprint of the season. and Yeah, it's all good. I can't complain really, but I just hope to be feeling a bit better today. So when, you, when was it that you found out about Aqua Blue then? Um, about halfway through the year I got a call from him and then just kept in contact and then throughout the year, a bit later on, just after the Worlds I signed with them. They described the whole project and it was good, you know, it's exciting that there's a team that can, there's not many teams that come to you and say we've got a, like a self-sustainable team, and, but a properly self-sustainable team, you know, it's not like a, we're going to reinvent the wheel or do this kind of stuff, it's just a, a proper business that if it works well it'll be, yeah it'll be self-sustainable and it can only get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I guess this kind of, must have been kind of music to your ears when you've come from a team like Tinkoff then. Yeah, it was. It's just nice to sign two years here and get on with the guys well and just, you know, I think because it's a new team, all the staff are new, so it'll be nice to get to know everyone and everyone will be on the same page, you know. And what's kind of the initial thoughts and the differences or the comparison between Tinkoff and here? Um, it's just it's a new team. Everyone's learning the ropes still and... We're all new with everything that's here, you know. It's like we have the easy job of just getting bikes and riding them. Really, it's not really a, a difficult thing for bike riders. It's just all the staff, you know, organising everything, getting all the staff ready, and finding everything that we need. You know, I think that's the difficult part. But luckily, we don't have anything to do with it, so it's sweet. I think there's a lot of a lot of problems with the uh, with the uh, sponsorship model. Um, there's just a, a slight lack of security there. Um, sponsors come and go. Um, as, as you've seen with Tinkoff and I am this year um, and, and writers and staff are left without teams um, so what we're aiming to do is to to have the team completely funded by AquablySport.com which is an online marketplace um, which is launching at, at the minute um, so that th there is no sponsorship model so everybody who rides for the team is also a member of staff of AquablySport.com and is, is as involved as the website people as the marketing people as everyone so what kind of things will be sold on, on there? It's all going to be mainly, it's only bike focused? Yeah, very yeah, very much cycling focused. Um, but what we're aiming to do is to have uh, three aspects to the site. So there's a sales platform, which will um, give local retailers the power and the accessibility to the marketing that, that the team brings um, to allow them to compete with the bigger websites. Um, the, third, the second aspect of that is um, we're aiming to create a kind of a content hub um, where we will uh, do a lot of nutritional tips, uh, training videos, bike maintenance tips, um, race reports, that kind of stuff. Um, and the third aspect obviously is, is the team side of it um, where we'll give an insight into our races, previews, um, a lot of video content, a lot of social content um, and really I suppose build it to uh, I suppose the online location for, for all things cycling. Hi, I'm Matt Bramayer. I'm riding with Aqua Blue Sport. So, Matt, how has the race been going so far? This is kind of like your first race with Aqua Blue, isn't it? How's it been going? Yeah, pretty good. I think we're all uh, we all know each other. I think from from before, and uh, so we're kind of gelling all right so far. We've got Adam up there in the top ten a couple of times. Um, we're going to give it another go today. 
I think it's going to be more of a day for Adam today in the crosswinds. But uh, yeah, in in general, everyone's everyone seems happy and it's a nice atmosphere. And uh, for me, that's the most important thing. So you've been managing to get into the break every day, which is pretty good. Yeah, I think it's pretty important now for the team to be uh, visible in the breaks. You know, just looking forward for just publicity for the for the brand, obviously, and um, just to try and get things in motion and. It's all going good. So when did you first hear about Aqua Blue? Uh, it was kind of middle of the year last year. I heard a few rumours and started uh, prodding about and trying to find some information, but it was all pretty quiet. I think it was it kind of kept things hush-hush for as long as possible until they, they had all the plans exactly dialed out. But uh, yeah, as soon as I knew it was going ahead, I was I was uh, full on trying to trying to work out what was going on and, and get my foot in the door. Because I guess the whole kind of, the model that they're building it on, that it's going to be sustainable, that must be quite sort of a bit of a draw to most riders, right? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think there's a couple of teams who are trying to start it. I think Katusha have started with their own brand, but this is like the first project which is going to be you know, hopefully fully sustainable. So, um, self-sustainable, sorry. So yeah, it's definitely a draw. Of course, it's an Irish team, which is which is a big draw as well. And just the whole the whole ethos behind it, how they just want to focus on like the sport inside of it and just look after us as riders. And I think you know it just makes total sense to me. We're kind of the most valuable commodity on the team, so it just makes sense to to look after us and you know put us in the best condition on race day. And so, what are kind of what are your kind of goals with the team for this year? Do you have you got much a sort of plan set out? Or? Uh, I think it, it's difficult to set specific goals. I think as as a new team and a pro content team, we don't have you know black and white race program yet. But you know, I want to I want to have a good classics campaign, and I just want to be I want the team to win some races. You know, personally, I'd like to win something myself. I, I didn't win anything last year, so uh, you know that's a goal just to win a race and. Yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's about all where I'm at. When you set out, was there kind of like a rider wish list that you wanted for the team? Um, yeah, I think where we've ended up is is uh, is in a brilliant position. Um, we've got great sprint options. We've got uh, very good guys for GC. We've got a brilliant mix of, of youth and experience uh, and a lot of guys with world tour experience. Um, so to say, I've kind of been there and done it. Um, the likes of Lars Petter Nordhog is, is, is obviously a brilliant tap around, uh, especially for the younger guys like Dan Pearson and, and, and those boys. Um, but yeah, we're very happy with our recruitment. And what was it? What was your pitch to some of the riders to, to try and get them from the World Tour to come to Pro Conti? Um, I suppose we are trying to do everything from from a different aspect we're not trying to reinvent the wheel but we are trying to just put our own twist on stuff um, so what we want to do is run a single race program and have it very focused and objectified um, and give everyone clear objectives from the outset uh, and let them focus and train accordingly for those um, and I suppose pay, pay a lot of attention on not over racing and how many riders have you got on the team 16 the 16 yeah okay and how many of those were from or part, were race world tour eight eight yeah. okay so who are your main riders that are going to be sort of like the lead focus in the team? Well, Lars Petter, who's come back from Sky, is, uh, would be our main GC guy. Um, then we obviously have Adam Blythe, uh, Sprint, Andy Fenn. Um, so I suppose those kind of three. Um, then uh, with Lee Howard, another great option for sprints. Um, so yes, yeah, so they'd be our, our main guys. And what was kind of the difference that you that you said that you could offer to guys like Lars and um, and Andy who were going to come over from Sky? Um, I think just laying out a plan for them at the start of the year, um, and, and 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 setting these objectives for them rather than having them racing every week. Um, we want to give them these objectives and give them adequate time to really focus their training on and get on achieving these targets. And what's kind of been the initial reaction as the team as they've come together over the training camps and Yeah, brilliant. We had our first training camp in in Cannes, uh, mid December. Um, where a lot of those guys would have, have, have met each other before um, but it's the first time spending proper amounts of time together um, and it went really really well uh, we've got we've got a, a great bunch of laid back guys um, and everyone's got a brilliant attitude all the staff are, are getting on extremely well with the riders and it's just it's just gelled really well I'm Mark Christian uh, riding for Aquabus 4 
So, Mark, you've had a really good week this week. Uh, first race with Aqua Blue, yeah? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah, I think we've sort of uh, come here to kind of do what we're uh, looking to achieve. We've had, um, you know, like plenty of coverage on the TV. I think we've had a man up the road most days. Uh, we just missed it today there. But, um, you know, other than that, I think we've been represented really well through the week. And Adam's been sort of backing that up with good, uh, good top 10 results in the sprints as well. So when you say you've had a man up the road, that's been new most days, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I've been, uh, couldn't really help myself this week. I've been, uh, managed to chip into the right move a few times. So, um, had another go today as well, actually. But, um, yeah, it was just, it was a pretty manic one today. There was, um, a lot of people interested in getting there and it didn't go until about 40k. But, um, now we were all sort of chipping in together again today to try and get up there. But, um, yeah, just unfortunately missed it. And again, um, Adam was up there in the, in, when it came down to the sprints as well. Was that down? How did that kind of pan out? Did that pan out how you wanted it to? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, you know, Adam sort of said like we can kind of help him earlier on and stuff. But you know, when you get to the ends, uh, you know, competing against the you know the, like Dimension Data and quick stepping up, you know, like man for man as a lead out, we're going to struggle to compete. So we can sort of get him to the right sort of position in the last couple of k. And then he's quite happy then to sort of surf around on his own, and he's really good at that as well, positioning and finding the right wheel. So, um, you know, he's been able to be in the mix there and uh, come away with some good results. And are you also accustomed to sort of riding with all of these guys and racing? It's been quite a good team. Is it quite tight knit right from the start? Yeah, it's been good. Like straight from the um, straight from the off, really. I mean, everyone's getting on really well so far, and um, you know, it's early days at the moment, but you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of looking forward to the rest of the year, really. I think this is just the start of a start of a good year, hopefully. Whoever you are, whatever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. Obviously, very grateful to them. Uh, doing some exciting things with Rafa this year as well. Uh, details will be released soon. We're going to have a bit of a relaunch soon. New Are we? New sound, new, oh, yeah. new oh, look. Okay. Yep. Pay attention, Daniel. You know this. You've been briefed. You've been briefed. We've got lots of exciting things coming down the slipway, thanks to Rafa. So um, stay tuned for that. Uh, that. That'll all kick in once the season proper starts. Not that, you know, this racing, it doesn't well, matter. You it'll just, be a bit after the season. The, the season proper starts with Het Newsblad. Yeah, um, and then, officially. But this will this will kick in a bit after that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we heard there from some of the people behind Aqua Blue or involved with the Aqua, Aqua Blue team. Um, what do we? What do you guys think? I mean, the the model just to explain it is there's a wealthy Irish businessman behind the team, Rick Delaney, uh, who's based in Monaco, obviously well connected in the cycling world, and they want to build a, a structure, a business model whereby. Uh, the team become self-sustaining. They have a, a marketplace, a website, selling stuff and, uh, and and keeping the team going. What do we what do we think about this? I mean, we've we've there's been similar-ish ideas before. Is it is it realistic? It's moving away from the sponsor model, I suppose. Well, it is. I mean, we we address the sponsors and the the ethics of the sponsors in last week's uh, podcast at quite some length, and uh, some of the feedback we got. One of the, one of the um, things that a couple of people said was that we didn't really address the business model um, behind cycling well we didn't in last week's episode um, it would have gone on for about an hour and 40 if we'd, we'd, we'd uh, tackled that as well we have talked about that quite uh, at quite some length last year and um, one of the subjects we covered with Jonathan Vorters something that we touched on in the 2020 vision episode for friends of the podcast this reliance on sponsors and um, the, the the bid to try and diversify really and um, no one yet has quite managed to do that I mean I'm, I was thinking back um, probably 10 or 15 years now to um, the team that David McKenzie and Sean Yates were involved in uh, a small um, a small Australian pro team David McKenzie had ridden for the Linda McCartney team and, and they tried to set up a team which was funded by basically crowdsourced wasn't it it was a very early crowdsourcing but before the internet came along and made crowdsourcing um, easier and and that team it, it I mean it didn't work basically um, but this you know, there there has to be something in in uh, as as the sport goes forward, where teams can have um, less reliance on sponsors whose contracts will inevitably come to an end, and you know they they then they they have nothing sort of behind them to keep them sustained 
um, while they search for, for other sponsors. Very often, if a sponsor pulls out, it does mean the end of the team. So um, certainly, you know, it's a, it's, um, you know, a, a worthy model, one that, that may well pay off in, in the medium to long term, as, as many teams look to try and move away from reliance on one source of funding. It seems quite ambitious to be setting out with the aim of relying 100% on the, this, you know, online setup. I think if it can contribute something to the team and keeping the team running, that seems more more realistic, perhaps. But but who knows? I mean, we wish them well. Their kit is quite striking, uh, a bit similar to Movie Star, but they had a good good week in Dubai and a good good time at the Sun Tour as well. They, they rode the Herald Sun Tour. They rode well. They've they've certainly made themselves uh, they've got themselves seen and made themselves known in the races they've done so far. Yeah, just just to add, Rich, on the business model, I think um, you know anything, every little helps. Who says that line? Was it Sainsbury's? Do you shop at Sainsbury's? Um, no, I, I, no. Um, Neto, and it was Tesco. Or, but, or, I mean, sorry. No, anyway, yeah, no. um, as far as like div- diversifying the business model, if you can get a million here, two million there, then um, that's great. However, if the budgets in professional cycling continue to be inflated the way they have been inflated over the last few years, then um, it's not it's not going to be enough. And it doesn't help. You know, we talked last year about uh, you know, Peter Sagan's salary being almost a bit of a, a, a sort of watershed moment for the finances in professional cycling. Um, there have been a few of those, you know, huge contracts that have really taken cycling into the next league. Greg Le Mans was one in the 80s, and I think Sagan's was another. And, um, you know, as soon as one guy... And in this case, it was Sagan was earning what he was reportedly earning or what he was reportedly asking for. So, you know, upwards of four or five, well, I think now, um, certainly upwards of four million euros. Then, you know, you had people supposedly like um, the, the vanity signing, my mate, what's his name? Kwiatkowski. Um, supposedly asking for an awful lot of money. Um, and then it just gets, you know, it snowballs and um, things kind of get out of hand get out of sync with the money that's certainly coming in to the bottom of the sport. And we've seen that with the Giro wildcards. Um, you know, teams like Androni and Nippo told that, you know, they they can't compete anymore, then they're not competitive, among other reasons for them not being given a wild card for the Giro Wall. It's very, very difficult to compete when your whole budget uh, is is two million euros and someone like Peter Sagan might be earning five. Just to go back, uh, David McKenzie's team was called iTeam Nova. It was in 2004, 2005, around about that time. Uh, I know people may well wonder what that team was called. But yeah, they basically, they asked for people to sign up, subscribe and support the team. Um, You know, fans funding a team at at the end of the day, um, you know, they didn't manage to raise enough money to make it successful. But uh, like I say, there, there probably will have to be um, uh, you know something else to if if not to sustain a team entirely certainly to supplement what they're able to attract in terms of sponsorship you mentioned the feedback on the last week's ethical report it, it was limited in, in what we could do you know we, we tried to keep each report on each team brief so it wasn't you know it was it seemed to have divided people people were either really interested in sponsors and their ethics or or not interested at all it seems it's quite a polarizing issue this um we did get some interesting feedback though um uh somebody called david owen emailed in and and, and made some very good points uh, you know talking about bike manufacturers for example we we spoke about orica the the mining company and some of the the controversies around around them um but he said you said for example trek or scott or someone were an ethical bike builder let's go backwards where do the materials come from? What is the manufacturing process? In what country are they made? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. How are wildlife impacted? Um, Shimano. Um, it, it, you know, you could burrow very deeply into uh, these. As I said, all these companies are, you know, part of a wider part of the wider society that that we live in. Some some more humorous uh, comments. Well, Gilles Renard. Um, had been hoping for a Marxist analysis. Sorry about that, Gilles. <laughs> um, Martin Richardson tweeted, just listened to the cycling podcast and now wondering what the, Eric, the what the Orica caravan lobs into the roadside crowds. Well, that's another point as well, isn't it, that we didn't touch on last week, but you know, something that we probably will return to in future. You know, Cycling itself is a very green activity, but professional cycling 
probably isn't. Hundreds of vehicles, mm. pe riders flying all over the place, um, all the materials and bikes and stuff being flown and driven you know I, I remember being shocked really the first time I realized I mean it's just something you did I didn't appreciate but just how much diesel is being put into a team bus for oh. example 600 euros was being put into um, a team bus that when I was on the Dauphiné one year and you know we're filling up again as sort of two days later and um, leaving the leaving the engines on those buses running all day so that the air con's on particularly on a, I noticed this on a time trial day you know when the riders are in the bus all day um, churning out the fumes and uh, I mean there's been very token ethical efforts haven't there with regard to um, the feed zones and riders being encouraged to throw away their gel wrappers and their bottles in uh, you know, especially marked areas and fines being given out for for riders who don't use those areas, and you know that's a small step in the right direction. But um, you know, people have always have said, why don't they use electric cars or hybrid cars? And I think it's only really now that the that the vehicles are being developed that would have the reach to do long stages. I know Milan San Remo even. Uh, back in the 90s, the, the Subaru cars that the US Postal Team had had to stop and fill up en route because they couldn't do 300k on one tank of petrol. So um, yeah, these, th these are all things that will inevitably have to be addressed over the coming years, I'm sure. No, there, it wasn't all bad. I mean, Ian, Ian Williamson, uh, the, listening to the episode, prompted him to check his taps. Uh, and upon doing so, he realised they were hands grow taps. So that was nice. Oh. Uh, it's co sponsor of the Bora team, of course. Um, uh, moving on, moving on. Um, Roger Wachowiak died, the oldest surviving Tour de France winner uh, after the death, as you said earlier, Lionel, of Freddy Kubler a few weeks ago. Um, Wachowiak, famous for winning the Tour as a, as a sort of, well, a almost unknown, certainly un un um, underrated rider. It's interesting, he won it. Uh, after three straight wins for Louis on Bobby, and he had been very dominant. He didn't ride the tour that year. It was missing a lot of stars, actually, the 1957 tour. Sorry, 56, 56 tour. Um, and often we see that, don't we, after a, a champion retires as a sort of vacuum. You know, I think of, you know, Bjarne Reese's surprise win in 1996. Um, so, you know, after... Uh, you know, even 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 Stephen Roach in '87. You know, after Eno had retired out of Le Mans, not there. You you do sometimes see that. Yeah, winning Ala Walco, as uh, Walkoviak did. Uh, Daniel, you can perhaps explain the, the the origins of the phrase, but that's very different to winning Ala Reese, which is something quite different. Um, blood, yeah, blood like syrup. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, 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 that expression was coined or has been coined in the last few years. Um, a la Walco, referring to Walkoviak's win in 1956, basically meaning that Walkoviak had won thanks to a, a rogue break. Um, he'd, he'd actually gained time on numerous stages in the first week. Um, there was one break though where he gained 18 minutes. But that sort of overlooks the fact that he held on very, very bravely, particularly in the Alps. And he had outclassed, outridden the big favourites who were Charlie Gore and Federico Bahamontes um, on the flat in the first week. And um, you know, a la Walco is one term, one expression we still use. Um, French and Italian also have their own... Um, other expressions for th this kind of phenomenon of the rogue break. In, in Italian, you say fuga bidone. Um, bidone is a bucket. So it's literally a bucket break. Um, why? Because um, bucket in Italian is another word for like a scam, a fraud. Um, and no one seems to know why it's sort of a, a synonym for a scam or a fraud. And there's some, there is one theory that um, people used to scam customers in shops by getting old produce beyond its expiry date at the bottom of a bucket and selling them that was, um, who knows. Um, and in French, you talk about an échappé fleuve, which is um, literally, well, it's, all, it's kind of like a river escape. And I've asked numerous French friends of the podcast in the last 24 hours the origin of that phrase, and no one knows. Um, so anyway, um, the, the, that, that phenomenon of the rogue breakaway, um, it's happened a few times in major tours. Um, Claudio Clerici did it in the Giro d'Italia in 1951, um, won the Giro d'Italia with a very long breakaway and wasn't a fancied rider at all. Um, but it's really died as a as, as a phenomenon in the last few years um various reasons or theories why that that might be the case um 
sorry, it was the 1954 Giro that Clerici won. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously radios, the advent of radios, race radios in the 1990s meant that the riders on the road had more and more information about what was going on in breakaways um, and could sort of dose and economise their efforts so that they made sure riders didn't get too much time and they also knew immediately where riders who were in breakaways were lying on general classification and so forth. I mean, we, we've had a, a few incidents where um, the, the apple cart has nearly been upset in, in Grand Tours. Um, 2001, there was a stage to Pontalier in the Tour de France where there was a huge break got around about half an hour and Francois Simon had the yellow jersey for a few days thereafter and Andre Kivilev actually hang on for a very long time. He was eventually overhauled by um, Lance Armstrong and I think finished fourth on general classification. Then in 2010 Giro there was a stage again, terrible weather. I mean this is one of the factors that could um, could lead to a, a sort of break a la Walco succeeding again is it, inclement weather, terrible um, conditions which might create some sort of confusion. And so 2010... Extreme weather protocol. Well, exactly. Wah, so wah. The 2010 stage to L'Aquila in the Giro, um, a huge break formed and, and gained over 10 minutes and the Spanish well, rider... Richie, Richie Port was in that, wasn't he? That, he was, was he was. He was. Break? Yeah. He, he was finished a, seventh overall in Correct, year, correct. And David Arroyo of... Um, were they Movistar at that time? They were, I think. Um, he was the main benefactor and he had the pink jersey for a long time and was again eventually overhauled. So we've had a few. Um, I think the last big race that was won in this fashion, if you can call it a big race, was um, the the fondly remembered 1997 Tour of Switzerland, Tour de Suisse, when Christophe Agnolotto won. A French rider from Casino, again, gained over 10 minutes in a in a f kind of fluky breakaway, you would say. And um, again, even there, though, I mean, I think the common theme um, with these breaks is is often a confusion about who should be chasing in the peloton behind. And in that tour of Switzerland, I mean, uh, everyone expected Bjarne Arries to chase, but he was actually only doing the tour or his team telecom to chase. And he was only doing that race as training for the Tour de France. So, uh, you know, consequently, Agnoletto... Gained a lot of time. Almost happened in 1990 as well, didn't it? Well, yeah, I was going to say, a lot of the circumstances that had led to these kind of um, things happening uh, no longer exist. In 1990, on the, the second day of the tour, on the Sunday, um, there were two stages, a road stage in the morning and a team time trial in the afternoon. And it, it was in Futuroscope, which is sort of open and exposed. And uh, there was the usual kind of fretting about what, kind of damage the wind might do particularly in a team time trial where it might exploit um, weaknesses in certain teams and a break of four riders got away in the road stage in the morning at, at, and it contained Claudio Chiapucci who pretty much no one had heard of really at that stage certainly wouldn't have figured him as a, a potential threat overall Greg LeMond was a defending champion and he certainly uh, wouldn't have wouldn't have feared Chiapucci, not least because Le Monde had his own teammate Ronan Pensek of the Z team in that four-man break. The other two riders were Steve Bauer um, of 7-Eleven and Franz Masson of the Dutch Buckler team. And the circumstances were that that break gained 10 minutes, while a, well, it gained more than 10 minutes. It was 15 or 18 minutes at one point. It eventually got brought in to 10 minutes. It was only a short stage, probably only 120 kilometres, because they had this team time trial still to come in the afternoon. And the main reason that it didn't get brought back under control was because the Dutch Panasonic team, who really had their eyes on the team time trial in the afternoon, were instructed by their boss, Peter Post, not to chase, even though they had a rider from their great rivals, Buckler, in the break and there really was a standoff you know riders were sitting up and saying well look who's going to do this who are you going to chase are you going to chase Le Mans team refused uh, not least because they had Pensec up there and um, it took Le Mans you know it nearly backfired on him it took him three weeks to recover that time and Kia Pucci very nearly pulled off uh, what would have been an incredible surprise and although the time gap at the finish in Paris was two and a half minutes um, you know it was it was a lot closer than that out on the road and Kia Pucci almost pulled off that 
Um, so he almost went for the sort of counter attack, didn't he, on the well, last mountain? He did. He, he, you know, he turned the tables on Le Mans. He really took the race to him. And you know, we see, say that the yellow jersey gives people wings. Um, it a, certainly a, a attack it, when Le Mans had a puncture. As it was well, the making it? of Chiapucci, wasn't it, or Cappuccino, mm. as Le Mans called him, because he he really was a thorn in his flesh. Didn't like him very much. But although it didn't happen, you know, that that shaped that entire mm. tour. It made it. And and I have obviously not seen Walco's win, but you know, I can imagine if that did happen now. I mean, I. Who, who would be the modern-day Roger Walkoviak, um, Daniel? Uh, well, I suggested on Twitter yesterday it would be Jérémy Roy, the FDJ rider, but I just plucked that name out of, it, out, out of um, mid-air. It could be anyone, couldn't it? Um, probably have to be a slightly better climber, but just in, in the recent history of the Tour, actually, talking about times when someone has nearly pulled it off, I mean, 2006, of course, was... Uh, the, the, it was certainly a unique set of circumstances where we'd had Operacion Puerto, which had really decapitated the tour. So the favourites were gone, Ulrich was gone, Basso was gone. And then, of course, it was a, a Tour de France peloton that had been used to US Postal controlling everything for seven years. And Lance Armstrong had retired. So it was a... It was a bit of a rudderless ship, the peloton. Then Floyd Landis found himself in the yellow jersey. Then the stage to Montelimar, Oscar Pereira gets away and um, gains 35 minutes. And all of a sudden, well, it, um, he well, he takes the yellow jersey and Landis's position is kind of imperiled. But again, even there, uh, uh, you know, there, were, there, there was uncertainty about who should be chasing. And also... Unfortunately, well, from Landis's point of view, probably one of the weakest teams ever to win a Tour de France, his Fonac team, um, guys well, like... Hang, hang on. I mean, Pereira did actually win the Tour. Well, <laughs> well, yeah. well he, he did. Yeah, he was decided uh, in, easy, in to forget. Sorry, easy to forget. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> he, he did actually win that Tour. Yeah. Um, but it was a similar circumstances to 56. Very open race. None of the you know heads of state. And you can see, I can see two sets of circumstances. One is at the end of, you know, if someone like Froome bows out and, and there's no, say, no Quintana and no obvious favourite, that, that that's one circumstance. Another circumstance is some of the teams are so strong now that if, the you know, a number four on Team Sky, a Sergio Hinao or somebody, sneaks into a break one day and gets even five, six minutes, you know, well, something yeah. like that. This is this is what I was thinking, Rich, and particularly if, for example, Henao was to go away, and Sky, you know, Sky thought that that was a good option for them. Or let's say it was, you know, Ruben Fernandez for Movistar, mm. someone of that ilk, and there was another rider of another of a third miscellaneous team in that break who turned out to be even more dangerous. I don't know, for the sake of argument, a Roman Kreuziger or um, you know, someone with some pedigree. Um, you gotta watch Kreisinger, mate. You gotta go, you gotta watch Kreisinger, mate. Um, yeah, and 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 that rider somehow became or was overlooked in in the politics and the sort of standoff between the two big teams or the fighting for the or who thought they were fighting for overall glory. Then yeah, it, it could potentially happen, but I think there has to be some element of sort of force majeure. Um, some kind of unforeseen circumstances. You know, we've talked, well, we mentioned a minute ago the the state of L'Aquila in 2010, the Giro, the terrible weather and absolute um, downpour, and also in Pontalia in 2001. Just something that that creates uh, hesitation, um, which then leads to uh, a standoff between major teams where they're all looking at each other and saying, look, you know, when are you going to join in, or when it's it's not our turn? Um, but I think it's it's probably a, a once every twenty, thirty, forty year occurrence, isn't it? I mean, you look back at the, the history of cycling. I mean, even in in the Vuelta, um, Marco Giovanetti in nineteen ninety is often described as a fuga bidone. He won the Vuelta in that year. And um, is there not a Spanish phrase for it? Come on, I'm not come sure. On. I'm come not on. sure. I'm oh, not sure. Sorry, but. Poor. But he, even he, you know, he'd finish, well, he would go on to finish third in the Giro that year. So, you know, he was not, he was not a, a minnow, a donkey by any stretch of the imagination. Um, well, just reading the, the obituaries to Welkoviak, there have been a number of very good ones. The Inner Ring did an, an excellent um, summary. The, the thing that struck me, the sense of sadness that Welkoviak wasn't able to sort of celebrate his status as a tour winner uh, because he felt that it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't valued in, in perhaps the way that it should have been. And having just said what I said about Gerard Cielek's, um victory, in Milan San Remo, I feel a little bit guilty. Um, but while Koviak, you know, he was, you know, he gave something to cycling, didn't he? He gave something that that has its own name now. And if if 
any if these circumstances do arise, it, it will inevitably uh, be described as a tour a la Walco. Yeah, it's quite a sad story, really, uh, Walco. I've also a very good interview with him more recently uh, by James Starr on Bicycling.com, which I, I read yesterday as well. But even... The- Sorry, Sorry. Charles. Even in one-day races, though, um, it's becoming more and more rare that uh, that you get a freak winner um, by virtue of a long breakaway. I mean, I would love to see someone win from the early breakaway in Milan San Remo that inevitably goes every year, or or attack on the Turquino in Milan San Remo. But I was struggling to even remember a monument or a very big one-day race that's been won in this fashion. In the last well, two, 15, two, I mean, well, Jack, Jackie, yeah, Jackie Durand, mm. Jackie Durand in 1992 was certainly one. Um, Richard Ver- Tour of Flanders, wasn't it? Yeah, Richard Veronk. Sorry, Richard Veronk yeah. in Paris Tour in 2001, but again, it was a rider with real pedigree. So, yeah. Mark, I mean, Milan the other Remo. Mark, yeah, Mark Gomez at Milan San Remo, but that was that was the year they put in the Cipressa and and a couple of other climbs, and and uh, there was a certain sense of unfamiliarity unfamiliarity sorry with with the course so there was there was a specific set of circumstances which created that but you're right it would be great to see a real um you know a real shock sort of non-league team beats premier league team in the fa cup Boy, style yellow upset. card on that note i think on yeah, but on sorry. on the subject of you know reading about wakoviak in that era i'm big fan of the 1950s it's a fascinating time in, in cycling history uh, it struck me that we've not done an awful lot of you know really looking back at the some of the history of cycling would be i think we're going to be working on a special this year that will um uh nod towards that why, why are you smiling lionel <laughs> um but if if anybody if there's any story or any writer from history that you're particularly interested in hearing more about let us know because it might give us an idea or inspiration for a a Friends special. Uh, I'd certainly love to go back, delve back in time. And on the subject of Friends specials, um, we've produced our first one of 2017. Thank you very much, everybody who's signed up as a friend for 2017. You can do so at thecyclingpodcast.com. It costs £10 for the year. More if, you f- if you're feeling generous. Um, we'll produce 11 Friends specials. The first one is just out. It's uh, behind the scenes with Lotto Sudal at their training camp in Majorca. Let's hear a little clip from it now. I think we can hear... A little bit of uh, um, sort of uh, bedside talk from Lars Back and Adam Hansen. Is it important that your roommate doesn't have any bad habits? No, no snoring at night, keeping you awake. Actually, I'm snoring like an like like an old man, and uh, I have, actually, I have this uh, snoring brace now. Uh, but that's the good thing with Adam. You know, he say um, for me, it doesn't matter. You can do what you want. I I um, I, d- I don't. Um, I don't get bothered with if uh, or pay attention if you're snoring during the night. Uh, he's also a guy that's um, pretty flexible, you know, and with, with, uh, he also sometimes work late at night on his computer. So we, um, if I if I room with anybody else, I always have to take the, the brace on because I, I can snore a lot. And and also if I'm I'm blocked in the nose here in in, in the winter time, it's it can be loud. And uh, and if I and together with one day snoring, I'm also going to be, be angry, but um, then you have to fall, fall asleep first. <laughs> I have no problem. He has a special thing where he sleeps with, in his mouth, and I know it upsets him to use it, and I'm always like, Lars, you don't have to use it. I have zero problem. Um, I can sleep through anything. Um, I have no, no problem at all. <clears throat> we have a great relationship last night for rooming together because he does snore, and a lot of riders really dislike this from him. I've... Like I did down under once and I didn't room with him because my family was there and I spent a lot of time with my family and it was just easy, they can come to my room and I don't have to walk to their hotel and that. So I had a room by myself so my family didn't dis- disrupt Lars and he was rooming with another rider, I don't want to say who that rider is. And this rider was seriously hitting Lars with a pillow at night and he was like really angry because Lars, he can get very loud and I understand this. And the other rider wasn't sleeping, and he was complaining at breakfast. And you could see it; it hurt Lars. You know, he was—it was something that he had. And he was embarrassed about it, and um, and it wasn't for me. It was a nice situation because you know, okay, this rider I won't say his name. He couldn't get a good night's sleep. He was upset, and he was really angry and aggressive about it. And Lars was, you know, he was really embarrassed and upset and ashamed of it. And then I was like, okay, I room with Lars because I have no problem with it. And, um, and it's good because Lars can, you know, he can freely walk around and, and no one really knows about it because I just keep my mouth shut. 
Um, and it's good because I like to have late nights. I'm on my computer late at night and he sleeps with the, the thing you put over your eyes. So he has no problem that I'm up, you know, on my computer, clicking my keyboard. And he has no problem with that and I have no problem with snoring and it's good. I always say he's my um, husband at the races. So Lionel, this was your baby, the Lotus Sudal special. So I can say, because I wasn't involved with it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was excellent. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed making it. I really enjoyed going and spending a few days with a team that yeah, we, we deal with out on the road, you know, know quite a few of the people um, working with the team, but to actually spend time with them and, uh, and, and get some time with several of the riders and, and Mark Sargent as well, the team boss, who um, I find very engaging, you know, he's a very interesting person to talk to. And Lionel, we've talked before, haven't we, about Mark Sargent's answer phone message, haven't we? At least once. We've probably we've probably, we probably have, mentioned I can't it know. twice. I can't remember it. No. Well, it's it's a common theme with all the Belgian team managers. You you always call them up, and and um, their answer phone message generally consists of their first and their second name pronounced very, oh, yeah. very gruffly, yeah. and that's it. So your phone, Mark Sargent, and you'll hear Mark Sargent, and then you'll be ten minutes into what you think is a conversation before you hear the tone <laughs> and you realise it's his answer phone, and exactly the same with Patrick Lefebvre. Exactly. Patrick, Patrick Lefebvre. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it was it's it's very enjoyable, and I think we can hear someone like Adam Hansen. I think he's somebody who famously rides all three Grand Tours, has done for the last twenty seven years. But he is somebody who, in races, sometimes can be almost counterintuitively. Um, quite stressed by the whole thing you know he's got as well as yeah i think the shutters come down don't yeah we, he, he gets he gets kind of he funnels himself into got, talking about and he's got a serious and, job to do usually helping andre greipel or yeah. whatever and he was in very relaxed and expansive mood when you spoke to him yeah one thing we might consider actually for friends of the podcast is put all of the interviews on the feed unedited so people can kind of hear that full conversation with Adam Hansen. There's for quite a fair bit of it in... Well, he's an amazing character, isn't yeah. he? He lives in the Czech Republic, he makes his own shoes, he designs the software that runs the booking system, the, 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 the organisation system the for Lotto, also now for Bora. And so this year, they will be using a, a, an app that has been developed, software for which has been developed by Adam Hansen, which will take care of all the logistics, travel. And I'm thinking... Here, that if Adam Hansen is sneaky, he could really, he, he could, could mess him up. It. He could ensure that Peter Sagan d- misses his flight for, <laughs> you know, Hack Tour of California or something. Times. Yeah. Tour de France. He's the kind of bloke you hope never launches a cycling podcast. Who, Adam Hansen? Yeah. Yeah, don't oh, give him any ideas. That would put us out of business, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah, let's not give him any ideas. Right, on that note, let, let's, let's, let's finish things off there. We've probably gone on too much as usual, but uh, thank you very much. We'll be back next week with more exciting stuff uh yep lionel punches there uh, in the meantime <laughs> thank you very much lionel thank you richard and thank you daniel thank you chaps thank you to 13 senses and glass pair for the music in this week's episode and thank you very much to this week's producer mariana de forge